Awesome. So I'm also co-VP of programming. Tonight we have a very fun program for you tonight. Normally we have just a panel. Tonight we have a panel and we've got a keynote and we've got some uh, interactive exercises on how to network and network effectively and work the room and have a good time while you're networking and actually get value out of it. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce my good friend Nate Brown who um, very humbly says that he's not the most connected person in North Carolina, but he very much is. He knows literally everybody. Anytime I would send him maybe five, six introductions, he'd send me like 14, 15 back, and I just couldn't compete. <laughs> he was hobby. Uh, so Nate Brown is uh, a very interesting person. Not only is he an entrepreneur, um, but he's also a nuclear scientist turned financial planner which is a rare breed in and of itself. Uh, tonight, Nate is gonna be telling us about essentially his structure for networking and essentially how to build your own program and the metrics that you need to be looking at in order to network effectively. So Nate Brown, if you would come on up, take the podium. Absolutely. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Um, one of the things that I realized when I started building my network was that uh, there aren't a lot of educational resources that are designed to give you an understanding of how to put your best foot forward in these types of environments. A lot of people, whether or not they're thrust into it because of a job search or uh, in a sales role in a company or starting to grow a business, I mean, the most common types of people that rely on networking for their livelihood would be a business owner looking for new clients, a salesperson trying to hit a quota, or a professional in job transition looking for a new job. So what I put together tonight was uh, a summary of the systems that I used when I was building my network full time. Um, because what I found was most take, for example, professionals in job transition, they start by sitting in front of their computer, rewriting their resume, submitting it to the HR black hole. And they do that usually for about a month. And they get no interviews, no phone calls, no callbacks, no nothing. They feel like they're standing on the starting line spinning their wheels and they feel like they're confusing activity with accomplishment. So when that happened to me, and with that data in hand, I basically crumpled that strategy up and threw it in the garbage can, and went back to the drawing board to try to understand what variable, if I was able to track it, would actually <coughs> allow me to know I was making forward progress. Because what happens is that if you are constantly spinning your wheels, uh, it's very difficult to summon the motivation to keep going networking. So from that standpoint, when I looked at what variable you would want to track, because a lot of times, if you're pushing harder on a variable like the number of applications you put into the HR black hole, it may or may not push harder on the probability of you opening that door. So fundamentally then, there was an area of opportunity to know what variable, if you were able to push harder on it, would correspondingly push harder on the probability of opening whatever door you want. So what I found as I redesigned what I was doing was that that other variable is the number of advocates that you're building in your network. And my definition of an advocate is someone who I know who they are, I know what door they're looking to open, and I'm inspired to keep my eyes open for that door. Because at the end of the day, you never know how you're gonna be able to help somebody from a networking perspective. And trust me when I say the connection that you need is likely going to come from the strangest place imaginable. So from that standpoint, I wanted to share with you guys tonight what an overview of that system looks like because as I started to walk out into the world of networking, doing things as efficiently as I knew how, something very interesting started to happen to me. People started coming up to me at the events that I was at, saying things to me like, Nate, I'm in the same room, talking to the same people, asking the same questions as you are, but I'm not getting the results out of my networking that you seem to be getting. What are you doing differently? And this was about eight years ago. And I hadn't built some of these systems yet, so I didn't have an answer for them. But I realized that if there was something about the machinery behind the curtain that I created 
that was generating more efficient results. If I could understand what that was and if I could boil it down to its fundamental building blocks, I might have just tripped over an educational process that I could use to offer value to anyone relying on networking for their livelihood. So that is the, where the inspiration for my personal brand, Networking with Nate, came from. So Networking with Nate is my personal brand. It's a company I designed not to make any money. What it's designed to do is allow me to add value with my knowledge of networking or the connections in my network in a pay it forward mentality, exactly the same way that I would have liked to have been helped if the situation was reversed. And I did that because at the end of the day, the golden rules never failed me once of treating other people the way that I would want to be treated. So I wanted to give you a brief overview of that, um, knowing that we're only on a chunky timetable right now. Um, I drew out for you, obviously, uh, very, very basic, but this is the structure of the categories of activity that I track from a networking perspective. So this is a weekly exercise. I do this at 3 o'clock on Friday so that I can track my activity for one week and I can forecast my activity for the following week. But I track the number of events that I attend, the number of new people I meet, the number of networking one-to-ones I do, and the number of business one-to-ones I do. So the business one-to-one -one is the category that would be defined differently depending upon whether or not you're a business owner or a sales professional or a professional in job transition. So to use an example for as a professional in job transition, that business one-to-one -one category would be an in-person interview with somebody who understands the skills on your resume and has the ability to hire you. Almost every professional in job transition I talk to, and I do about 20 of those meetings every week, Almost every one of them says, Nate, if I could consistently get to that in-person interview, I'd feel comfortable going forward in the hiring process from there. But here I am, resume in hand, struggling to understand what activities to fill my time and energy with to consistently cross that gap. And that gap is precisely where these systems live. The business one-to-one -one would have that definition for a professional in job transition. The problem is, is how did you get into that category is completely outside of your control. So, while the business one-to-one -one is the most important category on the page, the networking one-to-one, -one, in my opinion, is the most important category to track because that is the last category that's entirely in your control. And any of our tracking variables from a metrics perspective should be in our control. We can control the number of events we go to, we control the number of people we meet, we control the number of networking one-to-ones we do, we control the number of advocates we're adding to our network. I can't control who next door neighbor or someone they go to church with is in desperate need of answers to a financial planning question. That last step, whether it is to get a job or close a deal or get a new client, that last step is always outside of our control and it's an exercise in frustration trying to control variables that by definition are out of your control. So what I suggest somebody focus on is what proportion of their time from a networking perspective they would spend in each one of those categories that are in their control. So the numbers that you have up there, when I go to a networking event for an hour, my intentional goal is to have six different 10 minute conversations, which is why you have the ratio between one event and six new people met. So in that conversation, all I'm trying to do is lead with my authentic interest and what I can do to help the other person first. If that inspires them to ask what they can do to help me, then and only then do I share with them what it is I'm looking for, because otherwise I feel like I'm assuming that they want to know, and I don't like to make assumptions. My second intentional goal is to gather the definition of treasure from the person I'm talking to, because I consider networking as a process to be a gigantic game of one man's trash is another man's treasure. And I like to sit in the middle of that process, gathering and storing the definition of treasure of everybody that I meet. Because, for example, I don't know how I'm going to be able to help my 7 o'clock meeting tomorrow morning, but I know that if I have a clear understanding of the trash and treasure definition of everybody in my network, I have a higher probability of reaching into that and adding value to that next person than if I wasn't interested in gathering and storing that information. Because at this stage in the process, we don't yet know who we actually want to build an advocate relationship with. All we know is that we need to lay the foundation of understanding how to be an advocate for all of the people we meet to guarantee that we don't miss anybody. Because I give, at this stage in the process, every person I meet the benefit of the doubt that they are the next best advocate in my network. Now we know technically that's a false assumption, right? Every person I meet is not gonna be the next best advocate in my network. But every one of them now, how, no matter how unlikely they seem, could have a next door neighbor or a coworker that is exactly the connection that you need. So we have to give them the benefit of the doubt to make sure we don't miss anybody. 
But, of course, we do need a way to validate that assumption to make sure that we're not wasting our time. So, the way that I set that up, the daily system itself, part A, within 12 hours, I drain my brain of the definition of treasure of every person I met that day into a digital searchable contact relationship manager. That's part A on the daily system. And the reason why I did that is because I found that if my head hits the pillow at night, that information of value goes in one ear and out the other, then I have a hole in my network training potential advocates as, out of it as fast as I'm pouring them in. So if there's a hole in my bucket here, activity never gets here, it never increases the probability of getting there. Somebody who isn't doing that consistently generally is just going networking rather than building a network. Because if the activity never gets here and it never increases the probability of conversion, the probability of your success is flatlined. It's not actually increasing because there's a hole in the bucket. Whereas if you're building a network, the probability of, in, of converting to whatever it is that your definition of success is increasing every day. And it's now not a question of if you're going to succeed, it's a question of when. Now, we still have one big hole in our boat because we've made the assumption that all six of those people are the next best advocate in my network, which we know isn't true. The way that I set up the ability to sort people is each one of those six conversations, the third intentional goal is to uniformly end each conversation, clearly communicating my expectations of building a relationship and what action item I'm prepared to take in order to make it happen. So paraphrasing that would say I'm talking to John. Say, John, I really enjoyed our conversation this evening. I'd love to sit down with you for one-to-one -one over a cup of coffee to see how we can add value to each other's networks as advocates. I'll shoot you a follow-up email when I get home tonight, and we can lock something into the calendar. Now, of course, in this day and age of technology, I could have pulled my phone out of my pocket. I could have put that meeting on my calendar right away. But then I'm making a choice, and I'm potentially fallible with my choices. Whereas what I really want to do is give every one of those six people the exact same opportunity to opt into my network with an action of theirs, because if I can do that, then they're going to sort themselves. So if I uniformly end each conversation telling them what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it, I then get home, run part A, drain my brain of the definition of treasure, which leaves me the cookie crumb trail that I can get back to building an advocate relationship with any one of those people if I want to. And then I jump over to my email to run part B on the daily system, which is again within 12 hours. I send a follow-up email with a specific expectation to each one of the people I met that day. Paraphrasing that would sound like this. Hey John, it was great to meet you at the AITP event last night. I really enjoyed our conversation. Love to sit down with you for a one-to-one -one over a cup of coffee like I mentioned. How about next Tuesday morning at 7 a.m.? I'm happy to accommodate the Starbucks across the street from your office. I look forward to sitting down with you. Hope you have a great rest of the week, Nate. 90% of that email is just copy and paste material. I'm just swapping out the name of the event I met. I'm at and the time that's on my calendar. But what I've now done is I've led with my authentic interest, I've gathered their definition of treasure, and then I've done what I said I was going to do, which allows me to then watch who opts into my system. Because at the event, if you lined all six of those people up in front of you and asked them all to their face, all right guys, by a show of hands, who's gonna reply promptly to my follow-up email? If you ask the question to their face, all six of those hands are going up, which is generally false evidence appearing real. So I don't ask them that question because I know I'm going to get misleading information. Instead, I set up an opportunity to ask them that same question with my actions so I could watch whose actions are in line with mine. And what I've found is that if you apply the daily system to whatever amount of activity is in the events and people category, it will drive that activity to the networking one-to-one -one in that ratio. Because I find that on average, two out of six people will opt into your network as an advocate. And those two people just told you with their actions, whereas all six with their words, those two just told you with their actions, they're probably the most organized out of those six. They probably have the highest understanding of the value of building relationships out of those six. And they probably represent the two best advocates for you and your network out of those six. And I didn't make any choices. Because even though I consider myself a perceptive individual, if you lined all six of those people up in front of me and asked me with my eyes to pick out the two good ones, I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again. Because inevitably it's the guy with the foot long beard and suspenders that knows everybody and I might not have picked him. But the beauty of the system is that if you lead with your authentic interest and you gather the definition of treasure and then you do what you say you're going to do, 
with a very high probability somebody who understands the value of building advocate relationships is going to reply to your email and say, yeah, next Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. works great. Let's lock it into the calendar. And the reason why I believe that that's so important is because this step is a substantial outlay of time and energy. You're driving half an hour over, you're sitting down for an hour, you're driving half an hour back. If I had to do that step with all four of the other people just to figure out they were not somebody I wanted in my network, I'd be wasting two-thirds of my time trying to build relationships with the wrong people. What inspired me to document this was when people started coming up to me and saying, Nate, I'm in the same room talking to the same people, asking the same questions as you, but I'm not getting the results that you are. It was now relatively easy for me to see why the efficiency of what I was doing was so much higher because if they were just going networking versus building a network, and if they weren't using a sorting filter such that they're wasting two thirds of their time trying to build relationships with the wrong people, it was now very clear to me why they could be in the same room talking to the same people, asking the same questions, but not getting anywhere near the level of throughput through to increasing the probability of success. So, I'm going through this faster than I normally do just because I'm trying to keep us on schedule. But from that standpoint, well, I mean, as an overview, the implementation of this system is unique to every individual, whether it's a professional, a job transition, or a business owner. So from this standpoint, I, I wanted to give you enough of the nuts and bolts of this. Um, I have a number of resources, whether it's webinars or YouTube channel videos or a variety of other things, and happy to find time to sit down for a one-to-one -one with anyone in the room. We'd love to see what connections I have in my network that may be valuable for you, and how we may be able to add value to each other's networks as advocates. So I just wanted to give you an overview of some of those systems and why I believe the efficiency is able to be increased by adding a step 1A or 1B inside of step 1 and 2, or potentially reordering the conversation. I'll leave you with if my favorite question to ask when I meet somebody new at a networking event is what types of connections, if I have them in my network, might be valuable for you? Because at the end of the day, you never know how you're going to be able to help somebody. And the most valuable thing that anyone has to offer from a networking perspective is the future value of the network they're prepared to build. So you're talking to somebody, you can't help them right now. This is what I suggest you say to them. Say, you know, John, I really appreciate you sharing with me what types of connections are valuable to you. I don't currently have those, any of those in my network right now, but I am actively building my network meeting 10 to 20 new people every week. And I don't know who I'll meet next week or next month, but now that I have an understanding of what types of connections are valuable to you, you can be sure I'm gonna keep my eyes open for ways to drive revenue to your business in the form of referrals. And when I find it, I'll make you a mutually beneficial business introduction. Because the future value of the network you're prepared to build is an infinite amount of value. That is the most valuable thing that anyone has to offer and it is very, very easy to point out to somebody that you understand that principle because that's what's going to inspire someone to opt back into your network is you leading with what you can do to help them first. So um, I'll be happy to answer questions specifically once we get to the panel, um, or I don't know if you want to do Q&A right now, but hopefully this has uh, given you some low-hanging fruit action items that you can take. Um, and put into action right away. And certainly, if there's anything else I can do to help you, please let me know. Um, thank you very much for coming. Let's do a few questions. Right now, right? Yeah. yeah, and then uh, we'll have a panel, and we'll, we'll do some role playing, and we'll, we'll have some fun. So it's Q&A. Q&A. What does the W stand for in your uh, so this is the weekly system. The, the networking roadmap is broken down into a daily system, a weekly system, and a monthly system. This is just the easiest way I've found to actually describe it, how they actually connect together. So as long as you do it once a week. I do mine at 3 o'clock on Friday so that I can track my activity for one week and forecast for the next week. But as long as you're doing it consistently in the same place once a week, you'll be able to see the same progress. How many friends do you have on LinkedIn? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> thousands, tens of thousands. Millions. It's not. It's not tens of thousands. Um, only because I don't usually connect with somebody unless I've actually sat down with them one to one. So I, I want to say it's over twenty five hundred, give or take. I 
Rick Pack, how do you keep it fun? You're meeting all these people, you're operating by a certain formula. Sure. So uh, what I found is that people can really be categorized into three different types. There are drainers, there are neutrals, and there are replenishers. The only way that I can do what I do, because I'm generally back to back from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. with a giant smile on my face every day. The only way that you can do it is if the majority of the people you're interacting with are replenishers. Because what I find the two largest categories of people that bounce off of that system are the talkers and the takers. Right? At an event like this, if you have a conversation with a talker, you'll have an absolutely phenomenal conversation at the event about all these things we can do and all these places we can go and all these people we can see, and then you'll never hear from them again. And they just made it very easy for you to ignore them as they bounced off of your sorting filter before you put a significant amount of time and energy. The taker is generally even worse. He probably already gave you a sales pitch about what a great financial advisor he was right in the middle of the networking event. And if there was no juice to squeeze, he probably threw your business card in the garbage can on the way out the door. The problem is that they all look the same. Honestly, eyes are incredibly deceiving. The talkers and takers will actually probably look better to talk to. And that's why I select these six completely by random. I let the rest of the system allow them to opt in with their choices. I try to make as few assumptions as possible. Great, thank you. You mentioned you started a company, but it doesn't make revenue. So what kind of a company is it? Um, so what I found when I was a professional in job transition was that I would have wanted someone to slide a copy of this map across the table. I would not have wanted to write a $2,000 check for that privilege when I was living off my savings. So the way of building this brand was very clear to me eight years ago of putting it in a complementary fashion, meaning there's absolutely no doubt that the caliber of information and the rest of the systems could very easily be monetizing that business. There's lots and lots of people in the triangle that think I am a fool from 30 set of win friends and influence people. My favorite quote from that book is, you can build more advocates in two months by being interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. So anytime I need to recenter myself on that, I just focus on being authentically interested in them. Right? Almost everybody loves talking about themselves. So it really isn't hard to be replenishing to others. All you have to do is be interested in them. That's that's the easiest way that I've ever found to organize it in my mind. Yeah. Nate, this is incredible. <laughs> really cool. Um, love the uh, formula approach. Um, how do you gather the uh, event that you'd like to go to to kind of put in the funnel? Great question. So. Um, one thing, the more and more you learn about me, you'll realize there's a systematic design for almost everything that I do once I show you the machinery behind the curtain. Um, incidentally, the, uh, the measure of whether or not I would want to continue to go to an event is up there already. Because I organize, uh, one of the additional resources through Networking with Nate is I aggregate my knowledge of the highest quality networking events from all over the triangle and I put them into one place. So that if somebody is trying to build their network, all they need to do is pick and choose from that. Many people have asked me why some events are on that list and why some events are not on that list and how I pick and choose. And the short answer is, is that any event that is not on that list is, on, is not on that list, not because I don't know about it, but because I've been there, I've led with my authentic interest, I've gathered the definition of treasure, I've followed up with everybody and I got less than two that wanted to opt in basically indicating to me that the average caliber of networking knowledge at that event is lower than the threshold. So all of the events that are on my list still are ones that are above that threshold. Because at the end of the day, if it's below that threshold and I don't think it's a valuable way for me to spend my time, I'm certainly not going to share my opinion with others that it's a valuable way for them to spend their time. So if you follow all of these things and you get less than two people opting back in, or any particular event. I'm not saying I'd never go back, but I certainly am using that variable to prioritize depending upon how much time and energy I have. And how many events do you try to do a week? Me personally now? Or would you recommend for people trying to build their network? 
Um, so normally when I write this up here, if you're looking at it from a basically full-time job perspective, um, the number of events would have a two to four as a goal per week. The number of people would have 12 to 24 as a goal per week. And the number of not working one-to-ones would have a four to eight as a goal per week because the combination of these two categories represents about a 10 hour commitment of time and energy. This category represents about a 10 hour commitment of time and energy if you're using those goals. And that's how I want to spend 20 hours or half of my time moving through to the tracking variable as efficiently as possible. Um, if you want to know what my actual personal goals were when I was at this stage, uh, ask me later because when I say those out loud in a presentation, it scares me. <laughs> I set very high standards for myself. So this is much more, that's why this is a unique implementation for every person. So this is something that I only usually do in the one-to-ones where I can get an understanding of what amount of time in, do we have before the monthly budget gets uncomfortable at home, right? That's one variable for a professional and job transition that's very easily going to scale the rate that we want to run this system at. Because if somebody is going to run out of money in two months versus somebody who's got severance for another 12 months, their pace of implementation is going to be dictated by other variables. Mike and I are going to trade off uh, doing a couple of questions to kind of get things going. Uh, for the first question, um, when we think about professional networking and developing relationships for um, you know, your career, what are some horrible networking mistakes that you can make when you're a... Uh, Hello? Okay. What are some horrible networking mistakes that you can make when you're trying to uh, develop a networking relationship with somebody that you've met at a conference? Go right ahead talk all the time about me and not ask about them. I think that's the number one biggest Most <laughs> faux pas, right? Is filling in awkward silences with information about yourself instead of asking questions and being an active listener. So too much I, 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 I. Sorry. I would say another one is making a promise and not doing it. Right, that one, that's kind of like a talker, or the, yeah. yeah. Not doing what you say. Not doing what you say you're gonna do. This goes yeah. back to the basics of, uh, you mentioned a lot of good basics, on be treated like the way you wanna be treated, be with your authentic self, um, so do what you say you would do, is awesome. Or do what you say you would do. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, so the my favorite um, is not being specific. So. From the standpoint of almost any networking environment, sorry, um, what, what you are trying to accomplish, first and foremost, is make it as easy on the other person to understand how to help you. Because in almost any of those situations, if you say something and their first reaction is, well, I don't know how to help you, I consider that to be my fault. 
I did not make it as easy on the other person to understand how to help me. Meaning I put too high of a hurdle in front of them to jump over and they just shut down and said, I got nothing. So by being specific, you're lowering the hurdle. You're making it easier on them to understand how to help you. So not being specific about what you're looking for. If you are a professional in the job transition, that'd be what positions you're well qualified for, what companies you're targeting, and what introduction level into that company would be ideal. Yeah, absolutely. So that is going to jog the memory of somebody in the room in five seconds or less. But did he just say John Doe at Quintiles? John Doe's my next door neighbor. Right, whereas if I just said I'm looking to build relationships with biotech companies and RTP, does that jog somebody's memory? If it's vague, that's a much higher hurdle for them to jump over. Whereas they may say, no, I don't know that person. Right? But no is a perfectly valid answer because it was a successful, right? You got one or the other. Obviously, yes is better. I know the person, I can introduce them. But the only answer that I consider a failure of mine is if the other person says, I don't know how to help. So the next question is one of my favorites. When you're going to a networking event, there might be 45, 50 people in the room, they're sitting at white tables and whatnot, they're drinking wine, Coca-Cola's and everything else. How do you essentially start your conversation? Do you use an icebreaker? And if so, what is it? Right oh my so I like to pick out the loner that's not talking to anyone, that doesn't know anyone, and approach the person that's all alone. And it's easy to just be like, why are you here? What brought you here? I think in American culture, we are too quick to judge people and ask, what is your profession or what do you do? And put people in labels and categories. And so it's better to be like, we're at an event. We must have a similar interest. Let me try to find a common thread before I categorize you. Um, and obviously you don't know anyone here and you're new, so let me make it less awkward for you by giving you someone to talk to. Um, so that's my take on walking into it. I think that's a great one. You know, what brought you out tonight? Um, is, is, I think that's probably one I go to when you're asking if you have a go-to. Um, I think you can also just say, like, what are you working on these days? And, um, that kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, being in, being too specific about if it's their their job or if they don't want to talk about that or if they want to talk about something else. Um, I would say one real easy one is how long have you lived in the triangle, because there's so many people that didn't grow up here that that's almost always a very easy one that you can build into after actively listening to other questions. Um, so that would I would say that's my favorite. Uh, the one other thing that I'll add on. Um, Normally when you walk into an event that's a open forum, an open networking environment, you'll see lots of people out in the middle and you'll see a whole bunch of people on the edges. Um, one of my favorite strategies to build on that is I will start by talking to the same person that you started talking to and once I finish the 10 minute conversation, I'll look out into the middle and see who else I know that they might like to know. Because one of the, one of the biggest challenges is if you're there by yourself, and two people are talking, and you walk up to them as an individual, right? You're standing there, they're standing here, and you know they're looking at you with scans, you know, and, and how do I join the conversation? It's very, very awkward if it's one person approaching two. So after I talk with that person from the sidelines, I will look at somebody in the middle, I'll walk out to them, and I'll tell the person I'm walking out with, I'm gonna start listening to their conversation. I'm gonna wait for a break in their conversation. I'm gonna pause you, and then I'm gonna introduce you to that person, because what happens is then you just switch them. Right? If you're walking out in a pair, you introduce the person that you just brought out to that person, you introduce yourself to the person they were talking to. Yeah. It's a fantastic way to take from the center, move to the middle, and then once you finish your conversation with that person, you just go right back out for another wallflower and start the process over again. Who do you intentionally avoid at networking? <laughs> and why? And why? You guys can always go first. <laughs> just hand it to me and I'll take it. Yeah. I don't mean I don't mean names. I meant types. The the drunk, the one that stood at the bar the whole time and and obviously is celebrating or drowning their sorrows. Or and um, my least favorite people are the me monsters, the people that all they do is talk about me. But the, but that the person that can't hold their own. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I um, Well, you know, at the end of the day, you don't really know who you're talking to. So I, I try to give everybody I meet the benefit of the doubt that there is value there. Some people will make it very, very hard to find that value. Um, from the standpoint of actually ignore or don't interact with, um, you know, it's, it's a real catch-22 because some of the people that are the most valuable look like they are the least valuable. And some of the people that look like they're the most valuable are actually the least valuable. So I try not to use my eyes as part of the sorting filter. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one of my favorite ways to handle all those situations is when I follow up with them, right, there's a reason I put the time that I'm offering to meet at seven in the morning. Because at the end of the day, right, you're going to get a real quick understanding of the amount of value that the other person perceives in meeting with you if they agree to meet you at seven in the morning. It's the reason why my event is at seven in the morning. If I put it at 10 in the morning, I have twice as many people show up, but it would be a quarter as valuable for everybody in the room because it's now half full of the wrong people. I refuse to charge money. If I charge $50 at the door, that would sort people out, but it would sort out the wrong ones. I find a time gate is much more effective than a money gate for sorting the right people from the wrong people. I have one more. So I don't tend to hang out with people I already know. So usually I'm at a networking event, um, being a sales professional to meet new people. And so if I've already heard your story, if I'm already helping you, if you're already a part of my network, I'll quickly introduce you to someone that I think can provide value, but the purpose of me being there is to meet four new people that evening. And I don't want to spend an hour socializing with a friend that's already a known entity in the network. Great point. So, so the one thing I'll add to that is, one of the easiest ways that I've ever found to disengage if you find yourself in need of disengaging is to say, now I'm sure there's lots of other people that you're looking to meet here tonight. I don't want to monopolize your time. I'm going to know all our secrets and they're going to feel really disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I got two guys. No, I'm good. Those are my two. The drunk and the person I already know. Oh, sorry, the drunk. Cameron? She has a question first. Thank you. And how do you guys track maybe? You know, if you're on a sales force or things like that, I mean, how do you measure? Do you actually want to reach out to phone numbers? Besides just a business card. Yeah, you don't have one. Have you I mean, it? it sounds like Nate does have a CRM. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. That's I've, great. I've, I've been on and off on the spreadsheet before, but it's a good reminder to, to get organized and do that again. So I appreciate that. Um, I do LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. I always I I, I link in with people who I haven't had a one-on-one -on -one with. So um, I, I definitely recommend using that. I think most people do. So I'm thinking much more like okay, I met them here at this event. I'm going to email them again. Or how do you guys measure who actually this is my A category, B category, C category? Yeah. Um, I think it's really hard, and I think one of the hardest things is people showing up to networking events without business cards. So you're the giver of the business card because you come prepared and they don't have one in return. And so then the power is in their court to reach out to you unless you're awesome at remembering everyone's name that you talked to that evening. And finding them on LinkedIn. And again, common name, Kate Lewis. There's thousands of us. So good luck trying to figure out which one I am, right? And so. Um, I think if you go to a networking event and don't like have a pen and paper, or like I've written on the back of my business card other people's names, or be like, give me your email, here's my card, let's fill it out. And um, I think women, women's clothing is at a disadvantage because we don't have pockets like men to put like, these are my cards in my left pocket, and these are the cards I've collected in my right pocket. So I'm, I'm not like, you get me, you hear me. Right? Yeah. And so you're like, then you have like at the bottom of your purse all these business cards. You're like, what event did I meet this person at? And so I, re I turn really hard at the end of the night, as exhausted as you are, to write at least the event that you met the person at on the business card. Because you're not keeping the business card, you're entering it into Outlook or whatever your contact database is, whether you have a CRM or not. Um, you need to know where you connected with the person so that in your follow-up you can um, attribute it to that event. 
sorry, that totally mm-hmm. tangent about women clothing, but you get it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was doing that last week, so no pockets. Um, so I'll, I'll throw a couple of, of pieces to that. Um, I don't use LinkedIn for it simply because LinkedIn is great for me connecting to you. <coughs> LinkedIn is not really designed to me for me to introduce you to you. Yes, it is. You, you can, you can. So the, the other reason I don't use LinkedIn is because at, at the end of the day, right, their name, their phone number, their email address, the fields that almost any CRM is going to have, that's just the starting point. The, what I consider the essential functionality of a CRM is to be able to customize user-designed searchable fields, meaning that what I'm most commonly searching my database on is the definition of treasure categories, the ideal referral or the ideal strategic partner introduction. So I have no place to put that information into LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is fantastic for a lot of things. But as a CRM, I mean, you don't generally need anything as fancy as Salesforce or Act with their automation capabilities. But I don't personally consider Outlook or Excel to be a CRM because it lacks the functionality to customize the user design searchable fields. Uh, There's a lot of ones that are in the middle. Some of them are complementary up to a certain amount. Um, If anybody wants, specifics, um, I'll be happy to share that. But that's the most important element of the CRM to me and how I categorize and how I follow up. It's all on the definition of treasure categories. So for the developers in the room and entrepreneurs, we're looking for a tool to capture <laughs> these custom data fields in the CRM. So dresses with pockets is what you're saying? Well, that's the clothing that's the <laughs> and retail of the field. I'm saying the developers in the room can develop the CRM for the for needs for us. Uh, I'm going to make a comment that Kate brought up. Um, one of my network events, I probably go up there probably 10 a week. A lot. Uh, you know, I'll be ones and twos on business cards. Huh. And ones is one that I want to get back in touch with. And then uh, I may make a mental note at a break uh, of those people I met who I want to get back in touch with. And all those business cards uh, I scan in to an act database. And I hit that database and I download LinkedIn as a, as a database and I link them both together. And mm-hmm. I keep track of who I've met, who I want to contact, and actually create an email that goes out to actually contact those people. So it's almost like a process. It's, it's all about relationship management. Mm-hmm. Who you want to be, who are the, the treasure people, and who are not. Yeah. Uh, and what are the ROI you're getting out of it? If you're going to have a time going to a network event, you know, what do you want out of that event? Who do you want to meet? Uh, a lot of times, you guys network events, they'll have a list of companies going to be there, and I'm pretty good at looking at the name tags, especially if I company on it. Yeah. Say, okay, I'm on the healthcare clinical research, so I'm very interested in those kind of companies. So I will look at those people in those events because that's the ones I want to talk to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just one thing I want to add to that. So the. The the last piece of that system, which is the monthly system, plays into the keep in touch element that he was just referencing. Because one of the things that you gotta realize is once you build an advocate relationship with somebody, right? You know, you walk away from that cup of coffee, the knowledge and value that you can provide to each other is as high as it's ever going to be. And then the next day it's down a little bit, the next day it's down a little bit. So if you don't have a systematic way of refreshing your advocate's understanding of what types of connections are valuable, to take that law of diminishing returns and bring it back up, such that on average, everybody who is an advocate in your network has you top of mind, I find that once a month, with permission, is the ideal frequency for that keep in touch. And I just blind carbon copy everybody, so I'm not blasting out contact information. I'll say something like this. You know, dear network, over the last month I've added connection one, two, and three to my network. If any of those are valuable to you, I'd be happy to make you an email introduction. I've found traction for my brand working with X, Y, Z types of companies. If you happen to have any connections to John Doe or Jane Smith, decision maker at those companies, I would welcome a warm introduction. Make it a great month, Nate. So that is just that's just me making sure that if I met somebody two months ago and I was looking for this two months ago, but now I'm looking for this. They could be doing everything I asked them to do as an advocate, and they're just working off of outdated information. So if you don't have a systematic way of refreshing that, the probability that somebody who is an advocate isn't as efficient an advocate for you is very, very high because they're not running off of the most up-to-date. Just out of curiosity, sorry, Leon. Um, how large did you say your advocate 
2,500. Say about 15,000. Give or take. I, I'm, I'm estimating. <laughs> See? Um, so, I don't have your Excel every, everything together, no. So I'm, I'm good, but I still have areas of opportunity. Okay, so I was at a networking event and I talked to the drunk guy in the corner. It was kind of cool, changed business cards, and then the next day he's messaging me on LinkedIn, and suddenly I'm kind of thinking, eh, maybe he really doesn't have a lot to offer me. I don't have a lot to offer him. So I'm just going to ghost him for however long I possibly can and hope he just goes away. Is that a good or bad technique, and what do you do to disengage with somebody that you've already connected to on LinkedIn? I, I mean, and I didn't really do that, that's just an example. <laughs> <laughs> just so we're clear. I don't know, I, that, that's a tricky one. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, if, if you need to, you know, let someone, if you need to go, so maybe that, if it was really persistent, maybe that might be the only answer. Um, otherwise, I would try a tactic like, you know, doing one thing or doing one thing that you agreed on. Um, and I don't know. I'm sure Nate has a formula about this. I can't hear it. I think ghosting and passive aggressiveness is harsh. Um, so I would always try to provide value and redirect. So I would delegate, or I would say, here's someone that may be better suited to assist you at this time in your phase of your career or this cycle that you're in. Um, or I would put the onus back on them to do their homework and research. Uh, when you tell, when you can tell me how I can help you with a named contact or company or target of interest, then let me know. But right now it seems that you are unclear of your specific ask, and so I'm unclear of how I can assist you at this time. Um, but I am a huge advocate of yes and no are really acceptable offers or answers, but maybe passive aggressiveness and ghosting is right. is rude. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, if the sorting filter worked properly, you wouldn't find yourself in that situation, but <laughs> none of these things are perfect. So in the instance where that happens, I generally just put more hurdles in front of the person. So my 7 a.m. as the time that I want to meet is a good hurdle. That generally will separate the wheat from the chaff. Devil's advocate, mm -hmm. working mother. 7 a.m. never works for me, especially when my husband is traveling. So True, but you would probably write back. genuine good contact that wants to meet <laughs> nope. you. It just means I can't meet you at 7 a.m. True, ever. true, but the difference is, is that you probably would write back and say, say that doesn't work, here's another thing that works. Unless you're coming to my house and putting clothes on that's, my kids. That's correct. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but what I mean is, is that by using that when they read it, they're either going to be the right person who wants to opt in and they're going to give you another option, Right. Or they're going to bounce off. But I'll be like, 11 p.m. when the kids are in bed and I'm drinking wine, better option, let's right. do that. So, uh, but from the standpoint of somebody that gets through the sorting filter that shouldn't, right, I, I put more holes in front, like what you were talking about. So uh, what I will say is, is let's say that it was a, a, for, for a professional job transition. Let's say that they know I have connections at Lenovo and they'd really like me to open the door for them. So I'll write back and say, absolutely, I'll be happy to open the door, but that person is drinking from a fire hose right now. And so what I need you to do first before I do that is this, 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 and this. And very often what happens is that's the last time I hear from you. Cameron? And back to, can I just add one more on yes. what not to do? Absolutely. Okay, because this, when you were asking about this, and it, it reminded me of something that happened to me recently, which is somebody who had reached out on LinkedIn, like we had a, a, a same alma mater or something like that, and we got in touch, I gave him my cell phone, and then all of a sudden he was hitting me up, texting me, um, sending me a bunch of things, like numerous like referral codes, like for, for weeks. And so that, I mean, like after I did like three referrals on the job and we had, we had a conversation and like, that was, that I felt like that was enough at that point. So I don't know how to say, okay, uh, this is not my full-time job, finding a job at my company. Um, so I don't know, I'm open for suggestions on how to handle that or maybe, maybe there's words out here like when people can kind of say, uh, 
like know when they might be wearing out the bubble um, yeah. on the network. So um, I run a transition group, but I also happen to work for a recruiting firm, but I'm on the sales side, I'm not actually a recruiter. Um, surprise to a lot of people. And um, so I tell people, once I've met with them and you're in my LinkedIn, that I will help you and introduce you to anyone that I can that will facilitate you during this transition, but be prepared, this is a bi, this is a mutual street, right? Like, this is bilateral traffic, and if I'm gonna introduce you to people that might help you, be aware that I may have other people in my network that need you and your connections, and I may be hitting you up reverse because you worked at SAS and you may know someone there, but I'm helping you get out of SAS and go to Cisco. And so I make people aware when they're in my network that as many favors as I may do for them with the intros that there are also asks in return and I think those are the best relationships that are mutually beneficial and um, and it's not just what one person can do for that one person um, and I also find it really distasteful and I have some people that I meet that are in transition how can I help you and I'm like I'm not asking you while you're in transition when you land somewhere and once you've gotten comfortable in your new role, then we'll talk, right? But like right now, you're the person in need that I'm trying to assist. Um, but I don't know if that's my two cents. Yeah, but also to build on mine too, <laughs> one of the things I was thinking about to, to mention is to actually do ask. I think a lot of times we don't ask specifically enough or make the ask if there's if you know somebody could help you yeah. and, and they are willing to be an advocate for you. I think that's one of our, as a human, like you, you don't want to, ask for a favor, but reframe it for yourself that um, that it's a chance for that person to give back. Right. Maybe that person has had a, a lot of people that did a favor for them, and you've just given them a way to feel um, like they're helping. Yeah. So do, do, do make the ask if yeah. there's something you know someone can do for you. And luck swings in both directions, right? Like right now you're in the position of helping, and then in the next swing of things you'll be in the position of giving. So, you know, it's... Yeah, it's don't be afraid to ask and be humble. It's really hard when my clients who are tech execs, 20 years in careers are impacted by a RIF and have always been in positions of hiring and always been in positions of authority and haven't been a job seeker to realize like, how do I go back and ask the guy that worked for me 10 years ago that's at my target company for help to get into that company? It's a really humbling moment for some people to be in the reverse seat of power and to ask for help when they've always been the person giving the assistance. Um, the one thing I would just add to that is um, I used to struggle asking people for help and one of my mentors reflected back to me this and I've never had a problem with it since. He said, Nate, do you like helping other people? I was like, yeah, of course I like helping other people. Does it bring you joy when you actually can help somebody else? Yeah. One of them puts a giant smile on my face. He said, well, do you realize that you are robbing the other individual of that joy by not asking them for help? You are assuming that their answer is no. I've never had a chance, i never had a problem asking for help since. Got a question? Yeah. So, hey, do you pass that person on to a friend or an enemy? <laughs> I don't have any enemies. <laughs> I have <laughs> no, always a colleague or a friend or someone who I think can better assist. Because I'm not usually the best person to assist. But I don't think I have any enemies. But comic cards are on the end of the table. <laughs> for, for someone who's uh, basically happily employed. I realize there's there's some value to uh, maintaining uh, an effort in this regard, but to, to what extent, what would you recommend? I, I have kind of a second part of that question. Uh, because I don't go to networking events and things like that, I, you know, I do have a family, and we do have friends, and, and we meet acquaintances through like sporting events and, and other things that our kids are involved in. Yeah. And it's really tempting to say, oh wow, that's a technology that I work in too, and, and do you, you know, but then to what extent is it, appropriate to mix your your friendships and your your you know acquaintances with, with now I'm trying to get something from you. I like start. I have yeah that's such a loaded question. So yeah. the to the first question, um, 
most of the time I estimate or I ask somebody, what amount of time and energy do you have on a weekly basis to dedicate to this process? So if somebody's working full time, that answer is usually five to 10 hours a week. So let's say it's five hours, right? Worst case scenario. So the way that I break down that system is that there's a certain amount of the percentage is the same, meaning approximately 25% of the activity in all four categories. If I've got 40 hours, right? Those are big numbers. If I've got five hours, those are small numbers. What I found was the most important is the ratio of your time spent in each category off of what total amount of time you have allocated to that. Um, so I don't know if that specifically answered your question, but I am always a proponent of dig your well before you need it because I hope that you are fully employed with that company for the rest of your working career, but the probability is not in your favor. So, um, so there is no longer the permanent, the idea of a permanent job. Full-time employees are cut every year more times than one year. The bigger the company, the sometimes the bigger risk, although startups flop as well. Um, and uh, my husband happens to work for 12 years for the same very large Fortune 100 company in town that I will not name because this is being recorded and will be on YouTube. Um, <laughs> and, and he does not put an effort in networking outside of that organization and has a great reputation inside of that organization, but that organization is not loyal to him and is not going to take us to retirement. And he owes it to himself to be out there networking because you never know when the hammer is going to drop. And layoffs and restructuring and reorgs happen to companies of all shapes and sizes and all health. And um, it's, the, it's the new new, right? I mean, the last decade has shown us that. And so I think you do yourself a disservice if you don't invest in you by going to technical, professional networking events and organizations, not to plug AATP because I'm on the board, but you are a JavaScript developer, you need to be learning JavaScript and going to free meetups once a month and learning about JavaScript or blockchain or whatever the next technology is. And we are in a fortunate situation to live in an economy and a market that has a ton of diversity of opportunity here. And there are thousands of events monthly that you, and we still make it, and I, we, you need to make an effort in training and certification and staying current because no employer is committing that they are going to pay, keep you employed through your, your end game at this point. And, um, and the best way is also to keep in touch with your colleagues that move on and go to new companies because when you leave, you have something in common, they can attest to your work ethic and they're now seeds for you in new companies. And so LinkedIn does that for you professionally. And you don't have to be friends with those people on Facebook. And you don't have to be friends with those people on Instagram or all the other social media, but LinkedIn is a professional network for your former colleagues who have moved on and gone into new um, companies and organizations in town to stay in touch with. And, um, and the neighbor thing is there's a polite way and a proper way to bring it up. And um, I was insulted, I was insulted <laughs> the other day um, at a neighbor's birthday party when I found out that my other neighbor who I adore and and we have kids the same age and we do bunko and, and drink wine with I didn't know she had quit her job and she doesn't know how to find her next job sorry that's all, it's all good, um, all good. And I'm like, you know, like I can help you write your resume, I can help you network, I can help introduce you to all these people. Oh, by the way, my company has four positions that you may be a fit for. How did I not know you quit your job two weeks ago and I'm just finding out now? And why did you not reach out to ask me for help? And I think it goes back to people are em embarrassed by being in a position of the need and afraid to ask their closest, dearest friends for help. Um, so I've got one other question for you since the, the wine has been flowing a little bit. I was gonna say, can, uh, do you want to touch on that one? I just want to answer this get second Get it. Get to it. Do um, it. So normally the way that I look at it is what is the worst case scenario? Meaning I want to know that even if everything I can perceive going wrong actually does go wrong, that the plan that I'm using has a plan. So 
if I'm considering talking to the other parent on my son's soccer team because I know that there's a common alignment, right? If I'm looking at that going, all right, what's literally the worst thing that could happen? They say, can't believe you brought up work at soccer game. Get out of my face. I don't even want to talk to you again, right? If I'm really trying to figure out what is the worst case scenario, that's probably it, right? So if I measure in my mind what an estimate of the size of that con is, then I look at the other side and say, what are the pros that are available? So in almost all situations, the pros are going to outweigh the cons. And therefore, while yes, there's a finite probability that it goes sideways on you, most of the time, the human brain is very, very good at spinning the negative in your mind of all of the things that could go wrong. And most of the time, it doesn't happen. So I would say try to control the negative self-talk on that's trying to not get you to do it, because most times, the pros outweigh the cons. And wouldn't you want to help your neighbor? So why wouldn't they want to help you? They're your friends. I don't know if that answered your question, but I think yeah. um, So one of the last questions that we wanted to ask was, um, what are inappropriate subjects at networking events to be discussing with uh, people that you don't know or don't know? Okay, very well. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when it comes to women, do not talk about that. Ever ask anybody if they're pregnant or if they have a baby oh, no. for any of us. Praise. Oh. Sure. I have been asked. Can you expand on that? I have been asked if I was pregnant and I wasn't. Wow. Okay. Just because you're not and I and I had already had the baby, okay? But just don't don't go there. <laughs> I always drink. You're not drinking, I assume. Um, <laughs> uh, we caught that on YouTube. Thank you. So, you know, it's it's the typical, like don't lead with with politics or religion. You know, or where you don't want to insult someone. Um, so trying to just have the the benign and neutral. I mean, here it's cool to talk about the sports though, because it's okay to be Duke versus UNC. Um, but but I would say um, the only topics really off limits would be anything that would be in that. You know, and there's a lot of topics off limits. Religion. Definitely politics. don't talk about politics. Don't talk about, you know, religion. religion. It's just not worth yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, I would, yes, I would agree with all of that. And the main reason is, is even if you and the person you're talking to have the same religious views, it's very likely that the person standing right next to you that can hear your conversation okay. might not. Or same thing. A lot of times you think you're having a conversation with one person and you may get along with that person. But what you don't realize is what's happening around you, and that can go sideways on you real quick. Um, the other one that I'll share is that um, the beware of the guy when they're talking to the girl that suggests the time for the one-to-one -one is 4 to 5 p.m. at a bar. <laughs> because what generally is coming after that is, well, hey, why don't we just go get a drink? Right, and so that's another one that is a very, very poor choice to go to a networking event looking to pick up a significant other. Or a second or third significant other. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yeah, oh, yeah. Totally. Can we pass yeah. the mic? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, somebody mentioned earlier well, that this is a interactive here. target. Yeah, yeah, this is it. This is, yeah. uh, this is taking over. It is yeah. now. Yeah. So I'll, um, I, I want to do the Q&A, but I also really want everyone to take some time to write their elevator pitch. Because we can get to that. But like, I think it's really important. When because so many people try to jam pack their elevator pitch with all of the information that they'd like to share with somebody that is much more appropriate for the 10 minute conversation that you're talking to them not for the introduction. So that's what I would say. And it's also to be like, here's, do we, should we take this further? Should we go find a private corner or a one-on-one -on -one at a later date and go further and explore common interests, right? It's a, do we have enough in common based on what you told me? Yeah. My okay. guess is we might not have enough time to do all of those things, so we might just go on Q&A and use that for a future. Yeah, I would just that use that as a future. That takes some thought. Yeah, 
Because there was a couple of questions, so That's I think that might be more assignment. value. Yeah, I, I think we're going to uh, break up shortly, but as long as they don't kick us out of the building, uh, I will be happy to stand outside and have you all run your elevator pitch by me, and I'll tell you if it's good or if it sucks. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry. Uh, question for people who are in uh, transit or transition or looking to be in transition. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for non-corporate recruiters, if it, like in your opinion, is there a limit? Yeah. Is there a limit to what the target number you should you know you should you know, like you should limit yourself to, or like, or is there any like a like, because like I hear varying you know, rules on that. So the only thing is making sure that you are aware of what companies that recruiter is representing you to, and that they're only submitting, and these girls will attest, they're only submitting you with your permission to those companies so that you're in control of which companies have your resume. Mm -hmm. um, because you may have a better connection or a better way in than that company. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily a limit of the number of recruiters, it's more about what's the best relationship and avenue into that opportunity? Um, and, and it might be an employer referral program and it might be a staffing agency. And there are, there are specific opportunities that agencies work on that corporate recruiters do not work on themselves, that they have outsourced. Um, the, the way that I would answer that question is, what I find is the biggest challenge for professionals in job transition interacting with external recruiters because internal recruiters sit off in a category by themselves. Which, right. So what most professionals in job transition don't understand about the recruiting industry is that they only want to find a candidate if they already have a company willing to pay them to find that candidate. I, I, I'm not trying to, to generalize it. I'm just saying that most, it, most of the time it's a one directional interaction. So what I suggest a professional in job transition do is understand enough about the way in which that recruiting firm is going to source their candidates. Meaning, they almost all go looking for candidates in their own database of resumes first. That's the small pond they go fishing in before they go to the ocean of LinkedIn. Which means that if we're not in their database, we have not made it as easy on their systems to find us when they want to find us. Now, yes, it is a double-edged sword. You do need to be very clear of the morals and ethics of the recruiting firm you're giving your information to for the, ref the point that you were making. But what I find is the most important thing is you're not calling the recruiter saying, here are my talents, here are my skills, can you get me a job? That's not the ideal way that I've found for professionals in job transition to interact with recruiters. But obviously, I would be happy to have corroborating other opinions. So I think it's fair to ask um, recruiters if they already have an existing relationship with certain companies of interest. Because it's a very long cycle, as women in the room can attest to become a approved vendor at a new company. And so if I'm not already doing business with ABC company and there's a job posting that you're interested in, don't put your eggs in my basket that I'm going to represent you to that opportunity. Find a company who is already doing business with ABC to represent you or figure out a way to apply it directly. So it's a very fair ask to say, hey, do you already work with this company, this is the position I'm interested in. Can you represent me? And I should be very able to give you a yes or a no and let you move on to the next company. Because it is a very long cycle. Thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you very much to Robert Half for sponsoring our event and enabling us to travel to the venue. Yeah, no, wine bar and have great food. Thank you very much.